Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm sharing the most powerful intimacy skill of all. My guest Whitney's husband was always criticizing her. He didn't appreciate her. He wasn't emotionally supportive and There was no connection there because she constantly felt wounded. She built a wall years ago, and through self-examination, she was able to tear it down. But she wanted to fall back in love again. Today, she feels loved and appreciated, and their relationship feels calm, peaceful, and connected. She's going to tell us how she did that. And then I'll be giving out the worst relationship advice of the week award, which I tried, and probably you have too, but it just doesn't make him want to grab you at the waist and pull you in for a passionate kiss at all. All that is coming up, but first, let's talk about the most powerful intimacy skill of all. Sometimes you feel like the only person at your house who is doing anything on the endless list of chores that must get done. Or maybe you're the only one doing things the way they should be done. Either way, it's a lonely, exhausting feeling. When that's how it's been for a long time, the last thing on your mind is looking for the teeny tiny things he contributes So you can express your appreciation and happiness at how he makes your life easier or better. It just makes you want to roll your eyes out of your head. Sometimes it's hard to even find something to thank him for when he's on the couch, feet up, zoning out. When you're coming in from work or yet another carpool run and the dogs need to be fed and there's no sign of dinner. It wasn't easy for me to find something to appreciate about my husband at first. I felt this incredible tug to keep complaining about what he wasn't doing. I didn't want to open my eyes wider and look for something to be grateful to him about. Yuck. Sure, I was miserable, but I was used to being miserable. And yeah, I wanted things to get better, but I didn't want to have to actually, you know, change, especially by being grateful, even though I knew I should be grateful. Everyone's heard that. You should be grateful. You should eat more vegetables. You should exercise more. It was just another chore I didn't want to do. But now I admit, I love counting my blessings many times a day. Not because I should, but because I love being able to create the experience I want to have. It's so exciting. Making a gratitude list for me is also pointing my manifestor toward happiness, abundance, and feeling thoroughly and lavishly loved and taken care of. Complaining about what I don't have or don't like is also pointing my manifestor, but it's toward the painful, lonely, overworked suffering I don't want to experience. What I focus on increases. What I focus on increases. So I want to be very careful about where I point that manifestor because I'm a powerful manifestor, just like you. When I express gratitude, whether it's toward my man or my life in general, my focus changes from what I don't have to what I do have. When I take time to look around at what I have and who my husband is for me, my life gets better than it could ever be if I'm going down the old dirt road of complaining about what I don't have. One difficulty I had with expressing gratitude was that it felt like I was giving up on having what I really wanted if I started appreciating my husband for the paltry little things he was doing. But it turns out I was completely wrong. When I started thanking him for doing the dishes, even though the sink was still a mess, he started cleaning the sink too. When I commented on how much I liked the clean sink, he started thoroughly cleaning the stove. I couldn't believe it. I almost fainted. Me deciding to express gratitude actually inspired him to do more. Who knew? Another obstacle to expressing gratitude for me was feeling resentful because I did so much and he didn't do very much at all. And he wasn't thanking me, so it just didn't seem fair. But when I decided to be generous with my gratitude, I was surprised that the whole culture in our home turned into a thank you fest with ridiculous but enjoyable arguments like, no, I'm luckier. No, I am. I felt so much more appreciated and a lot less resentful. Finally, the more I made a conscious list of how he sent in all the paperwork for the mortgage and ordered and picked up the takeout food I like and made the burgers for my friends after volleyball, the more abundant and well taken care of I felt. Was it just because I was noticing all that he did to make my life sweeter and more pleasant? Or was he actually doing more now because I was noticing it? 
It was both. That's why gratitude is the most powerful intimacy skill of all. What I focused on increased, and I could see plenty that I genuinely felt grateful for. On top of that, when my husband felt appreciated, he wanted to do even more to delight me and make my life better, which meant I had even more to be grateful for. You see where this is going, right? My perspective changed, and so did the way he responded to me. Putting on my gratitude for spectacles was a discipline at first, like brushing and flossing. But now I know it does double duty for making me feel loved, abundant, and taken care of. If you're having trouble finding things to be grateful for, consider starting with the basics. If your husband earns money for your family, maybe you can start with that. If he bathes the kids, takes out the trash, helps with the laundry, or puts the dishes away, you can be grateful for all of that. If he makes the kids laugh, or you laugh, or builds a fire, if he listens well, or picks up the medicine, or massages your legs, you can be grateful for that. And if it still feels like an onerous chore, Consider that gratitude has magical properties. It can turn an ordinary meal into a feast and an ordinary husband into your hero. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest Whitney's husband was always criticizing her. He didn't appreciate her. He wasn't emotionally supportive. And there was no connection there because she constantly felt wounded. She built a wall years ago. And then through self-examination, she was able to tear it down. But she wanted to fall back in love again. Today, she does feel loved and appreciated. And their relationship feels calm and peaceful and connected. She's going to tell us how she did that. Whitney, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, Thanks for having me, Laura. I'm so excited to be here. So take us back to the very, very bad old days of old. What what was going on in your marriage? Wow. Okay, well, um, well, I do have to say, when we got married, uh, my husband was attentive, and he was asking me about what I thought about things. And we got to talk about our dreams and exciting, you know, plans. And I felt, I did feel supported. We both were working and I was in a career where I felt successful and I was making money. And then after we got married about three years into our marriage, we decided to have children. And I decided we both did that. I would stay home. So what happened, which I didn't realize until, you know, years later is that I had been getting my worth and value from my job, my success. And then once I was a stay-at-home mom, I started to get my worth and value from my husband. And he's just a man. (laughs) That job's not built for him. And so the more and more as, you know, I'm still home and we have one child, two, three. I had postpartum depression with all three. Um, I had depression anyway, a bit, and some anxiety. And I just started to feel insecure. And I remember, you know, he... I, it was a lot for him to take on the kids, the, you know, sole income, and then kind of support me emotionally. And I remember sometimes he would say things and just hurtful things. Like one time I talked about something I was excited in. I was doing some side jobs and so excited. And he, I remember he said to me, you know, what planet do you live on? And, you know, and that was just heart. It was just heartbreaking. And then another time I remember he said, um, oh, I know what I, I told him. I said, you know, I really wish that you would be proud of me. And he said, well, if you would do something to make me oh. proud, maybe I would be. Ooh. Right? Oh. Yeah. And now I have to say, now, all the other wonderful things that he said along those years and like all these actions he was doing, I didn't see any of that. And then it got to the place where I hit a really dark place on my own just inside of me. And I realized I need to do something about me. So I did, I sought out, I had been seeing a counselor over the years and I sought her out and started to go every week. 
um, got some self-help books, joined some support groups, got a mentor. And I started to work on some stuff, you know, some insecurity issues and, you know, why didn't I feel worthy anymore? And what was that all about? And so I kind of dug deep and did some work on my own. And I remember, you know, it took a while, but things got better, you know, cause I got better. And, um, and I remember I ran into somebody along the way and, <laughs> and they said they were doing the same kind of thing as one of the sport groups. And, and he said, yeah, you know, I've decided I, I'm going to give it five years and, um, and then, and be the best husband I can be and show up for my wife. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to work on myself for five years. Like I really thought I was going to work on myself for a little bit. And I was just going to tell him it wasn't working. That it was time we needed to separate. I, he doesn't even know that. I never even told him that I was like on the brink of divorcing him. And I thought five years, that's so long. And actually it's been longer than that. You know, it, I've worked on myself for about six years, but then it's been, you know, I could tell things just weren't where I wanted it to be. We weren't as emotionally connected. Um, and I built, built up a wall. Um, I was so vulnerable for years and I realized that didn't serve me. At least I didn't think it did. So I built the wall up to protect myself. And the wall had become so high that I couldn't let him in anymore. You know, like I just didn't need him. And I was just so self, you know, serving. Like I just felt like I could, I could, if he wanted to divorce me at this point, I'd be fine too. You know, and that's not good. So I'd gone to the other extreme and I really wanted to find a middle ground and a balance. And that's when I found your book. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I so appreciate hearing this part about the, the anxiety and the depression and the insecurity, because you're not the only one, the postpartum depression, right? With the three babies. Yes. So, so you're a seeker. You decide you were driven. Like, how can I, how can I address this pain? How can I feel better? And it, it was certainly showing up in your marriage, but I love this piece that you were already taking responsibility. Like I need to fix Whitney. I, I want to work on you were already becoming your best self. It sounds like for many years before you found the skills and, uh, and you made some, some great strides. It sounds like in feeling, uh, feeling yes. more happiness. Is that fair to say? Yes. In fact, some of the skills that you speak of, I was using, I had discovered self-care. A friend of mine said, it's the first time I ever heard this, that self-care isn't selfish. And I thought that was like the best thing ever. I'd never heard that. I thought it was selfish. You take care of your family first and then yourself if there's time. That's right. And so I didn't know. And I actually started doing some things for myself. Um, I was going to movies once a week by myself because I loved movies. I'd like to, you know, I mean, that sounds so crazy now. Like, how did I find that time with three kids? But we made it work. And he would do something one night and I would do something another night. And, um, and I was working out, which I really enjoy. So I had brought some self-care in. I also was using one of the other skills you talk about, which is gratitude, looking at what I am grateful for instead of what he isn't doing and how he isn't showing up, but how is he? So I've been doing those, some of those things and, um, trying to relinquish control over like what wasn't on my paper, things that I could control. And I'm working on that. When you talk about the six skills, it kind of took it to a different level. Because I, I got to flip them all and kind of dig deeper and figure out, okay, gratitude's working, but how can I make it work more? You know, how can I look at this differently? So the skills helped me to, to explore that in ways that I, I didn't think were possible. So what did, what did you start doing differently than what you had been doing then? Like maybe with gratitude or another skill? Yeah. Well, um, so especially with gratitude, <laughs> with gratitude. So with gratitude, I thought I was showing gratitude. And one day I decided to to try it, your gratitude thing. And you had said, you know, why don't you, you know, say thank you for, or I'm grateful for. And so I remember I called him on the phone and I said, Hey, I just want to tell you how grateful I am. You know, that you're such a great man. You know, you work so hard and part of your family. And I, his response was, um, what do you want? And I was like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. I thought he knew, you know, I thought he knew how grateful I was. And that's what he said back to me. Not like, thank you. Or yes, you know, I know you appreciate it. No. And I thought, oh no, I've got some work to do here with the gratitude because obviously he didn't see that I was grateful. Um, I have to back up and tell you that. So the book was sent to me by my counselor, oh. <laughs> the one I had been seeing. And she sent it to me 
And she said that she had been reading it and working with the skills on her husband. And our husbands could have been twins. You know, they were the same kind of personality. And she said her marriage had changed. And I was like, there's no way. But what's funny about it is I let it sit on this bookshelf for nine months before I opened it because <laughs> it's so arrogant to think now. But um, because I thought, you know, I've done so much work on myself. I don't want to have to work anymore on me to make him better. You know, why do I have to be the one? And, um, you know, I, I just, it, it just makes me realize, you know, I, I thought I had grown, but I really hadn't. And until I applied the skills. Okay. I totally love this. Cause I think you're not the only one. I, I remember feeling the same way. Like I don't, why should I have to do all this work? Marriage is 50, 50. He's responsible too. This is, I've already done all this work. I, I'm more spiritually evolved than he is. That's the whole problem, right? He's not evolving and I am. And so what do you think got you past like feeling that way? Like you, you were exhausted from working on yourself already. I get that. <laughs> so what do you think got you past that to, to decide like, okay, I'm going to open this book again? Well, we were on, um, on the way for a family vacation. And, you know, as I say that, golly, on a family vacation, like, we're going to see his relatives, just things now I didn't even see before. Our family vacation to see his relatives, to spend time with family. It's so much of a family man he is. Like those little things I just took for granted. I'd say, well, of course we're going on my vacation to see your family. That's what you do. But no, that's not what some people do. But um, when we were on the plane, I brought the book and I was like, all right. Oh, and I even read the title part of the title. It says, do you want to feel adored and cherished? And I remember thinking, nah, I'm good. You know, like who doesn't <laughs> want that? But I had gotten to that point that I was like, you know what? I'm good. Like I have gotten myself to a place where I am. I don't need him anymore. But I realized that's not serving me now either. You know, like I, it, it wasn't serving me in the beginning when I needed him too much. And now I don't need him at all. And who wants to be in a marriage like that, where it's, I don't need him. I want to need him. Like I, I have a friend and I remember we went away for the weekend and she was talking about how sad she was that she was going to miss her husband. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? You're going to miss him? I'm like, I'm looking forward to the break. And I just was like baffled. I was like, I can't believe she's sad. I want that. Like, I want to be sad after 20 years of marriage that, that I miss him. I'm going to have fun with my friends, but like, I can't wait to get home. I didn't have that. And I was like, well, maybe this book, you know, maybe there's something else because I want that. I want to feel in love again. I mean, like, what's the point? You know, I'm with this man. We have children. They're still at home. Like I, we have years left and I don't want to just co-parent. I wanted to have fun and, and be in love. Yeah, so that's what made me get that book and start reading it. Uh, okay, I love this uh, too. I love the part where it wasn't enough. Like you felt like you were looking through a glass a little bit. Like, okay, there he is over there, but I don't feel like I need him. Yeah. I don't care about being cherished or desired right now. <laughs> but, but party, and I get that, right? I think that is. I think that's a pretty normal response, especially if you've been hurt and you've you kind of found a way to cope, and like that was the status quo but it wasn't enough for you. And I think this is really something that makes the women on our campus so special, right? It's like, it's not okay to just have an okay relationship. Like, okay, we're, you know, there's no fighting. At least we're, we're raising the kids. It's not enough. Right. It's not yeah. enough. It wasn't enough for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you kept going. So anyway, I just, I kind of just love that part of your commitment and your courage, right? Cause it is, it is something to say, okay, I, I know there's probably something about me. Okay, what is it? Let's let's take a look at that. Like, and that's that's kind of a painful moment, actually. It was for me. And yeah. like you described with the gratitude story where he said, What do you want? There was an epiphany there that probably wasn't yeah. very fun, right? You know, yeah, I felt like I had I mean, I had taken accountability for some of the past already, you know, that I realized that I had gotten to, you know, I'm part of this problem. I can't if I'm part of the problem, I could be part of the solution. So I knew that I could do something about it, but I really thought that I'd clean my side of the street enough. And when I said that, and he was like, what do you want? I was like, oh my gosh. And other things he'd said to me over the years, he would say, you know, you're lucky, blah, blah, blah. And I would think, what do you mean I'm lucky? You're lucky. Like it was a competition. And after I started to work on myself and the counselor one day said, you know, when he says that one day, why don't you just say, you're right, I am. I said, I can't do that. I can't agree with them. 
and say, oh, you're right, honey, I am lucky. And then one day I said, you're right, I am. And he, you know, didn't say, well, I'm lucky too. He said, yep, I told you, you know, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> oh, darn. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, well, hold on. If he says I'm lucky, it doesn't mean anything else. I can be lucky. It doesn't mean that he's not lucky or that I'm not. You know, I mean, I just stopped looking at it as a competition and started to think, well, wait a minute, I am lucky. And so then I decided to take it a little bit further when, once I started practicing the skills. And out of the blue, I would just call him up and I'd say, yeah, I'm really lucky. And he would say, yeah, yeah, I know. I've told you, you know, and he's kind of joking, too, because he's got like, like that. And we joke a lot, which I love his sense of humor. And so and but then one day he said, um, yeah, I'm lucky, too. And I was like, oh, there it is, because I'd stopped expecting it. You know, I wasn't saying it anymore. So he could tell me that he was lucky. And you know, I was saying it because. He was showing up, you know, I, I remember when he first said, you know, look for evidence of how he shows up. Like, what are you grateful for? And I remember thinking, well, I'm grateful that he, you know, takes the kids places and he does this for me. And you said, no, no, no. Does he go to work? And I was like, well, of course he goes to work. Everybody goes to work. And you're like, no, there's some men, husbands who they don't go to work. And I was like, oh, you know, like, does he pay the bills? I'm like, yeah. And he pays them on time. And you're like, yep, not everybody does that. So I started to look at all these things I had taken for granted that he does. And I, all of a sudden, it, like the list is like piling up and up all the things that he did for me. And so one night we, um, we were going out with friends and on the way to the restaurant, it just occurred to me, I hadn't said I was lucky recently. So I said to him, Hey, I'm, I just want to tell you how lucky I am. And he was like, Oh, you know, I, I feel like you too. And so we went into the restaurant and um, I sat down and the couple was there and I happened to just say, yeah, I'm a way over here. I was telling John how lucky I am to be married to him. And they looked at me like I had two heads and I was like, wait, what? People don't say this. And, and the guy looked at his wife and he goes, well, honey, why don't you tell me that? And she looked at him. She said, because you're the lucky one. And he goes, Oh, I forgot. You're right. You know? And I remember thinking, you know, that works for them now, but that doesn't work for me anymore. You know, like I want him to know that I appreciate what I have. And um, it was just beautiful how like I could let that go and be able to express gratitude and not have to have it come back to me. It is so beautiful. I, that gave me chills. So you became a more grateful person. Like that's the part that you brought that changed. It sounds like it changed the whole culture of your relationship because then he started saying, how lucky he was too. So now you have this virtuous cycle of, of gratitude in your relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, he was always very complimentary. He would say, you know, you're, you're really, you know, you're so pretty. And I would say, yeah, you know, thanks. But, you know, those kind of things, I just blew off. Like I thought everybody said that. And Mary's probably not, didn't even me, you know, and then I like started to look at all the things he does do. That's another thing too, is that, you know, you were able to show me that I for so long was looking for him to love me in the way that I thought he should love me. So when he would take out the trash, I never asked you to take out the trash. It's not how I feel loved. So I'm not going to feel loved by that, you know, or all these other things he was doing. And, you know, you were saying, find evidence that he loves you. And so I started to look and I was like, well, hold on. If I'll stop trying to make him do it my way, and relinquish that control. And then look, how is he loving me in his own way? And all of a sudden, like I saw all these things that he did. And I, even the other day, he um, loves to build fires out in the back. And we have a fire pit and he ordered wood. And I was thinking, oh, you know, you ordered wood for your fire pit. And I'm telling a friend of mine who we're talking about the skills. And I was saying, yeah, John ordered wood. And I went, oh, my goodness. I had just expressed a desire earlier that week for him to start making fires again. My mom had expressed a desire that she lives on the same street. She wanted to smell the fires. I was like, here it is again. I was about to miss it. Of course, he wanted to build fires. But here he was, not saying it, but he heard us and he ordered wood. That kind of stuff, you know, being able to look and like just dig deep and say, what, what are they doing? What is my husband doing to show me love that I have just been missing? And I would have missed that, you know, if it wasn't for the skills. Yeah. Wow. Love it. Love it. You, yeah, you put on your gratitude for spectacles. No question about it. And now you, now you get to see, and this was maybe there the whole time. It sounds like these kinds of I gestures. Think so. 
the compliments about so. how beautiful you are. Yeah. And, but yeah. now, now you get to enjoy them. They were, they were overlooked. It sounds like, which I think is very common. Something, something I certainly did in my early marriage as well. So was there a moment when you thought, okay, these skills, this are really working. Yes, definitely. Um, but I think for me, I saw the skills working for me to make me happy. You know, for such a long time, I wanted him to add to my happiness or make me happy. And I, I had such a hard time. If he wasn't okay, we weren't okay. If he was in a bad mood, I felt like, you know, the night was kind of ruined. And so the skills for me freed me up to like that, that whole part of self-care. You know, if, if he's not in a good place and he's not in a good mood, I can just say, oh, okay, and move along my way and do something for myself and bring happiness to myself. I have a lot more power than I ever knew. And so I started to do that. And so I wasn't looking for him to be different so much at first. I really wanted to, you know, I wanted to improve how I felt. And then all of a sudden, like, I remember catching myself going, wow, he's cute. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, I like, all of a sudden, like, I became more attracted to him. And like, and then I missed him. There was a day where I was like, I told you my, my friend, you missed her husband. And I was like, oh my gosh, I miss him. And I went, Whitney, there it is. You miss him. You miss him. And it was like lovely. So it wasn't even anything that he did, you know? Now he did do stuff and I've seen some of the results, but that was, that was kind of part of it is like, I, I can't, when I put those expectations there, you know, there's a saying expectations or resentments under construction. <laughs> and so like, I yeah. always had a resentment because he wasn't living up to what I thought, what I expected, what I wanted. And when I stopped looking for it and he kind of like shows up and does these sweet things and yeah, it's just, that's how I knew, you know? Oh, and then he, so of course I always wanted him to like notice, right. You know, like that's what everybody wants. Everybody, want, at least I wanted, I wanted him to say, Oh, Whitney, you've sure been nicer lately. You you sure have been acting differently. Like, have you changed? You know, because I want the credit. Oh, we all want <laughs> I that. To, yeah. Or pat me on the back and go, you've been working so hard. I'm so lucky. But, um, and that just didn't happen. And that's okay though, you know, because I, I was pat myself on the back and the other women in the community, you know, were like, Whitney, you're changed so much. And my girlfriends, you know, going to them instead of going to him, you know, you taught me that too. And then one day he said, I don't know what you're doing because he knows I'm doing the Laura Doyle and I'm becoming a coach. And he goes, I don't know what you're doing. If it's Laura Doyle or not, but whatever it is, keep doing it. And I was oh. like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it, right? But but I, I have to remember, that's not why I was doing it. You know, I wasn't because I want him to say that every day, actually, you know? And I'm like, it's been a few weeks since you've said that. Don't you notice I'm really working hard still? And I, I just can't, you know, like I, I, I can't, I can't want that because then it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah. And I'm all over his paper. I'm all over his paper then too, which you taught me that phrase. Right. You know, I'm trying to, to do things like think uh, on his paper, not on my own paper. Yeah. I think but as a mere mortal woman, I think we do all want him to acknowledge, right? That there's been a change. Like, and obviously, and you got that in a big way, right? When he said that, it's really gratifying to hear that he noticed because this is part of what drove you. This is, this was the impetus for this kind of self work was wanting to um, feel attracted to him, to miss him, to have him feel proud of you was one of your big desires, right? Early on. And yes. he was like, maybe you should do something. And now here he is saying, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So I think that is a pretty magical moment. And I hear you about like wanting to hear it every week. <laughs> yes, every day. <laughs> Morning, <laughs> noon, and night. I don't know too many wives who don't want that. So, so I think I think it's pretty yeah. new. But But I also uh, appreciate it's. I mean, it's a lot of discipline in a way to stay on your paper about this. And that's what I hear you saying. It's like, I'm really realizing this has been an inside job. You started it a while ago and the skills just kind of helped you up level the inside remodeling job that you've been doing. And so, and how is that? Let's, so let's just talk about that for a second. How, how is Whitney compared to how it was before? Right. Cause we talk a lot about the relationships, but this is, you're really bringing forth. Oh, I'm different now. I'm different. Yeah. 
Well, I'm like, I, I want to say happy, which I am happy, but I'm joyful, you know, because like joy is there even when I'm sad. You know, the joy is like the thing inside that, you know, I can be in a sad moment, but it, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to let me just bring me down to that pit where I used to live and think, oh, poor pitiful me. This is awful. This isn't the marriage I wanted. It's not the guy I wanted. So I've got the joy, but I also have the happiness. But I have a lot more tools and skills that when I'm not feeling that way, that I know what to do. You know, like I can go to gratitude. And there's a phrase, drop and give me 10. You know, so like I will constantly, it, I think it's just, it's human nature. Like you said, I'm a mere mortal woman. Things will go through my head and I'll think, oh, I can't believe you said that. Oh, I can't believe you're doing that again. And left the plate down on the counter again. You know, like, can you put it in the dishwasher, please? Right. Instead, I, if I go down that path and I, then I'm like, I've got this long list of all the things he's doing wrong again and what he's not doing right. And, and I used to look at that dirty plate and think, oh gosh, I built so much into that, Laura. It wasn't a dirty plate on the counter. It was, does he think I don't have anything to do? He must not think that I have any value. He must think I'm worth nothing. Oh, you know, it was just a plate on the counter. Like he was probably really busy. It doesn't say or mean anything about me. So now I'm like, oh, poor guy. He's probably really busy. For me to be able to flip that script inside of me is right. just like the dream because he doesn't have to do anything. Like he doesn't have to say anything. And that's what I needed before. I needed him to say the right word, to do the right thing in order to make it okay. And that's just not realistic. It really isn't. That's it's way too much. I'm putting him up on a pedestal. Like he can, you know, cure it all and he can't, but I can, like I can fix it if I choose that. A friend of mine, that mentor, I was talking about John, this phrase that um, feelings aren't facts. And that's beautiful because my feelings, oh, I would feel them. And then they became factual. And then it was like the world was ending. And now it's like, what are the facts? Well, the facts are he left a dirty dish on the counter. He is at work. He is supporting my family. He's calling me. He, he's like checking in to see how my day is. Those are the facts. He's picking up a child from school. He's coming home at night. He, he comes home at night. He sees us. He, he hugs us. You know, like those are the facts. I just thought I felt what I felt and that was real. And now yeah. I just, I don't have to do that. No. <laughs> it's really a big deal the day that you can arrest that needless emotional turmoil before it starts, it sounds like, and just not even go down the old dirt road that is going to lead to some unpleasant feeling that you're not wanting to experience anyway you sound very empowered around that yes and but don't think I don't like that dark road <laughs> I go down there I just you know like I, it's because that's normal I, and that, but that's another thing I don't beat myself up for going down the road because that was another part of it I was coming in the back door going oh, you've worked these skills I like how but that hurt me too the other night on Friday night I tried to intervene once again, get on his paper between one of my children and him trying to prevent an argument. I started out and I'm like going down that old road because that's what I know. You know, I've been doing this for, we've been married for over 20 years. So like these are ingrained in me and it's going to take a little more than like a weekend for me to figure out how to change or a year. I mean, 20 years of being that same way. So I give myself grace and I say, uh, yeah, you made a wrong turn. You went down the road a little, little while, but I don't reach the end of the road. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going down the end anymore. And, um, and that's the beauty is I can go down the road a little bit. And sometimes I, I test it a little bit. Like, well, maybe if I tell him again how to load the dishwasher, he will load it the right way. You know, like, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't. It's ne He's never actually for me giving him my opinion on what I think he should do about something. It's he's never said, Whitney, wow. I, you know, thank you. I've been trying <laughs> to figure this out for 50 years. And finally you, you have nailed it. Oh, what would I do without you? You know, and I keep thinking that's going to happen. And it doesn't, it just never does. All it does is it gets him in a bad mood. And then I'm on his paper and then like by the end of the day, like I'm in a bad mood 
when I was in a great mood, but I got all over his paper. And then he says to me, what's wrong with you? You're in a bad mood today. And I'm like, wait, no, no, no. You know, I, I didn't start off this way. So it really doesn't pay off. It really doesn't. Oh my gosh. You're so, you're hilarious. This is oh. a good laugh. because it's, it's very relatable. I could totally relate to everything you're saying. So what is your um, tip for somebody who's feeling like you felt where you just felt like he was not proud of you? He was saying all these hurtful things. He just, you were just in a lot of, a lot of pain. He built up that wall. Didn't really see how you could actually get back to feeling in love. Like what's your best tip for her? What should she do? She wants to create what you have now where he calls and says, how's your day? And he's uh, picking up a kid from school and you feel in love again. First and foremost, the piece of self care. I think, I don't think any of the other things could have happened. I don't think I could have grown unless I took care of myself first because I was still like going to him for different things and trying to get him to fill my cup up. And unless my cup was already filled up, it didn't matter. And so I think, you know, my first um, bit of advice would be definitely self-care. Uh, I think today as women, we are told that, you know, we need to be strong and we need to do like take care of business and, and taking care of ourselves is, you know, it's um, selfish selfish and it's really not and especially when you have children you're like well definitely can't take care of my kids now I mean take care of myself now I've got kids and I remember somebody saying to me you know what are your passions and I was like well you know and I listed them biking and you know art and painting and stuff and they're like are you doing those things and I was like well no I don't have time to do those things and they're like well that could be part of your problem like you're not doing things that bring joy to your life anymore so no wonder why you're not joyful and I was like oh and so I just, I didn't ask for permission to do those things. I started to do them on my own as if like, I was just making an appointment. Okay, I'm going to do this and I would go do it. And it was really awkward at first. It didn't feel comfortable. It felt backwards. And if he wasn't available to watch the kids, I would get my mom or his mom or hire a babysitter or get a friend to watch them, you know? So I just found ways to get some of the self-care in. And sometimes self-care wasn't something big, like going to a movie by myself. But it was like having law and order on in the background in the kitchen. I mean, like instead of just silence or instead of some music or something like a podcast where I could learn, it was just like mindless TV and anything that like brought me some happiness, um, just anything that I could, you know, there are little self-care items and there are big self-care items, um, self-care items, some that take two minutes. And then the other thing I would say is I kept trying to go to him. Like, I want to know how he felt. <laughs> I wanted to know um, he was okay. That was really, like you had said, I remember reading that you said, don't ask them how you're feeling. And I didn't feel like I was asking him that, but I kept saying, are you okay? Is everything okay? Like I could sense it. He wasn't, he was unhappy. And I felt like it was my job to fix that. And I stopped doing that. I stopped trying to figure it out and fix it. And that was really helpful too, not to try to, because it's really on his paper, but not to try to fix that part to you, you suggest this, you say, don't ask him how he feels, ask, ask yourself how you feel. And so I'm like, how do I feel? And then share that with a girlfriend, not try to share it with him. Because you had explained in one of your books that, um, that they're really not equipped, men are not equipped emotionally to handle all the emotions that we have. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I mean, they're really not, they're really, it's, it's so, it's not sad, but sometimes it's sad because I'm like, there's so many emotions out there, but they're really, but I'm glad they can't handle all that because they don't need to, you know, that's not their job. And, but the one, the women can, my friends can. And so getting a good group of girlfriends and people I can call on and say, I feel like this, but also girlfriends who aren't going to say, I can't believe he said that they'll say, well, how is that serving you? Like, how is that making you feel better to feel like that? Or like, didn't he just bring you flowers yesterday? I'm like, oh, don't remind me of the good things, you know, <laughs> you know, but when we do that and we're there for each other and we, and they're saying, so, what can you think of today that you're grateful for? And, you know, you're like, oh, you have to be so good. Okay. But that's the only way to get out of it is really to look for that gratitude and to go to those girlfriends and go to those other sources, not my husband to fill up that cup. Because then it's filled. So then when I go to him, 
if he needs some of that cup, I can give him some, but it doesn't deplete my cup. So, yeah. I love that. I love that story. That was a recent epiphany you were sharing with me before. And I just love it. You're continuing to grow and see new things for yourself, right? You've been studying to be, you started studying to be a coach like a while ago and now, and you're still having these new insights as you go along. So I love that. So what would you say to Whitney from, I'll say before, and I'll let you decide when that before is, because it's been a, a, a long journey for you, right? This is didn't start with the skills. It started before that even. But what would you say right. to Whitney from before that you know now that you want her to know then? Well, first of all, I'd give her a hug. She just needed a hug. She needed somebody to like go, it's okay. You can cry. You should be loved. You will be loved. Like, this is not it for you. And then find that friend. Like the, there was a woman I went to and she hugged me. And she was like, you're, you're good. You have value. You have worth. And, you know, just that love that I needed that I wasn't getting for him. And so, you know, I would give her a hug. And then I would tell her that, honey, <laughs> there could be some things about you that you need to change. And it might not all be him. You know, because like, I swore it was him, Laura. I really did. Like, I really did. And, you know, I I didn't realize that like, I had added years to being disrespectful. I was disrespectful. I had shown him that I didn't trust his opinion. I could, I didn't think he could figure out how to load that dishwasher himself. And I was going to have to tell him. And so I had done so much damage. So I would just really tell her that, you know, if you just work on yourself first, like forget him, don't fix him. He can do that. Or even if he doesn't, doesn't matter. Cause even if I, even if I feel better and fix myself, even if it wasn't okay with him, I would still be better for it. So, you know, to go out there and find, hopefully they find Laura Doral, but whatever else it is that like a support group of some kind, women, whatever, you know, a 12 step program, like, you know, anything, there's so many places where you can go and get help from other people who get you and understand and can provide that experience, strength and hope for you. Then I tell her it's going to be okay. I don't know what that okay is going to look like, but it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And, you know, I had to believe that there was a better way and I saw people live in it. So I had to believe if they find it, I could find it. And so, you know, just to have faith, you know, you mentioned that you talk about faith a lot, the faith over fear, faith over fear. Um, you know, I do have a higher power. That was really a lot of strength for me to not just look at myself, but to look at nature and to look at God and to look at all these other things that I could reach out to and found, find some, a place to ground myself, you know, like a belief in something else, something bigger than me. Um, that was so helpful. Like just the people, the loving people, you know, at least find one person you just can, can commiserate with, tell her what's going on and ask her to help you. And they will, they will, you know? Yeah. How would you describe your relationship today? What's it like now? It's a lot quieter. (laughs) You know, it's a lot more peaceful. It's like, I kept thinking that like, when we met, we were, I'm an extrovert. I don't know if you can tell this interview, but I love people. He's completely the opposite. He's an introvert. He, he appears extroverted because he does like people too, but he's a lot more comfortable, you know, on the sidelines. I want to be in the center of the room. And so, you know, I, um, I just, I, I feel like we, I felt like we were drifting apart and we were, we were different. And now it's like, I see the value in things that I didn't see before. That's what this has given me. You know, like I've mentioned before, I was, I'm glass half full, he's glass half empty. And I really thought that was a, like a character defect. Like people should not want to be glass half empty. There's nothing good there. I really thought that. And now I can see like, hold on, glass half empty sees that's realistic. It's um, living in the now. It's also like practical. They pay bills, you know, like there's so much good with glass half empty. And when you put it with glass half full, you can come together. And I guess I wanted to find a way that I could let my husband be my husband and not have to change him. 
and you mentioned this too, you say, you know, I wanted to marry myself. I kept thinking that. I was like, I thought I found a guy who was like me and then he became himself. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want that. I want you to show up like me and like what I like and love me the way I want to be loved. And, and that's me. And that's not what I want. Golly, that's not what I need. That's not what the children need either. You know, that yin and yang, you know, how like opposites attract, they really do. And so I just see the beauty now and how, you know, even when he's frustrated and angry sometimes, which I see men do a lot, women usually go to more emotional, you know, not as much anger, even though I definitely have anger too, but you taught me also look for that heart message. Like what's underneath his anger before I could just see the anger. And I was like, not the guy, not there he is again, that guy I don't want showing up again. Now I'm like, okay, wait a minute. That's just anger. What's underneath that? And most of the time it's fear. And I know what to do with fear. I can be, I can empathize with fear. Like I will with a girlfriend. If she's in fear, I'd be there to comfort her and say, it's going to be okay. Like I know this is hard. And when the anger comes, it makes me scared. And I'm trying not to be scared anymore, you know? And I find that like when I let it go and I go do self-care. So don't even say anything. Keep my mouth closed. Use that duct tape. Put it on my mouth. Walk away calmly. Go do something for myself. And all of a sudden he figures it out. Who knew? You know, like he does his own thing. And then we can come back together. If I just can keep my mouth closed long enough. So when I keep my mouth closed, the house is quieter. And it's calmer. And I just feel like, I I feel like there's really nothing that can come our way now that I can't figure out how to work the skills around and turn around and put it into perspective of like, this isn't, this isn't a deal breaker. It's just not. He's a great guy. He's a great dad. He's a great husband. Like I married him, right? I mean, come on. I heard he was so. so, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> He's, it's like a whole package, you know, um, self-starter, has done business, like what? And so, you know, I'm like trying to just let him be him and then I can be me and we can like kind of come together and, and it's just, it's so different. It's so different, but I will say there's more to come because we're not like, I, I still, I, I want more, you know, and I know the skills can give me more. So that's the other thing. I have not arrived at all because I've got more work to do on myself and, um, and just show up better. You know, like I love, you talk about goddess of fun and light and I want to be that goddess of fun and light and that goddess of fun and light. He married the goddess of fun and light and she disappeared for a while and she's back. So I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Laura, bringing her back. Yeah. <laughs> you seem pretty goddess of fun and light to me, Wendy. That's for sure. Aww. And so inspiring all that you've created and accomplished. And really, like the I think the before and after is really exciting because it's uh I wish it was physical, right? Like when you see the weight loss pictures, like three hundred pounds, you know, lots of <laughs> lots of, yeah, I'm right. But it, it's kind of like that, like, you know, depression, anxiety, postpartum, like thinking, okay, a year I'm gonna work on myself and then I'm leaving them, right? At two feeling yes, like wow, right. he's the whole package, you know. I've got I've got this man who's dreamy. Um and I'm lucky. I feel lucky right. to be married to him. Yes. Is um it's a it just a very big before and after, very dramatic shift. And uh, I do feel like we need to get trophies or something to start handing out like wife of the year or something, you know, like this is because it's, yes, probably, it's please. probably changed your whole family to have, you know, your whole family dynamic is probably different. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, you talk about the dance, you know, I changed the steps of the dance and he like, wait, what, what's going on here? Like I'm used to this dance. And so he had to change too. And, you know, they do say that people will say that like, if you, if someone changes for the good, like other people see that and it does, it rubs off on them and they change. And I did feel like though, I was like, you got the easy way out, you know, like (laughs) you got the, you didn't have to do all the work, but that's not really true. I think he did a lot of work and then like, the kids respond differently. And, you know, I, I, what I do love is I, I've made sure to not talk about what I don't like. I try to also talk about like, look what dad does and remind them because they need to grow up in that too. 
they need to see like, what does dad do? You know, what, what all does he show up for? And I'm like, did you see he did this? And I'll say that to the kids. A lot of times I'll say, you know, not all dads do this. You know why he did this and try to, so that they understand and they see what a great dad they have. Not all dads show up the way he does. And, you know, I think that's really empowering. And, but they see us, you know, when we've had our moments where, you know, we'll go back to old behavior and, and then stop and then see us apologize to each other, you know, and then, and make it right again. And then say, Hey kids, that wasn't okay. That's not okay to do that. You know, we shouldn't, you know, we know better, but they're so few and far between now that um, it just doesn't happen as much. It just, it doesn't, you know? So, but who knew like that I had so much power, I, the empowered wife, that's exactly what it is. I have much more power than I ever realized to change my relationship without him doing anything. And it actually is really good because it wasn't a lot of bad work on my part. It wasn't all this hard work. It was like a lot of actually inaction, not saying something, just keeping my mouth closed, not doing the thing I was about to do. And so, you know, there's a lot of that too. And, and I get the benefits, you know, when I do all that work, I get all these benefits. So yeah, I can going to continue to do the work like even more work. Well, great job. You definitely sound empowered, Whitney. And I love it. Thank you so much for sharing your whole story with us. This was Aww. wonderful. Thank you, Laura. I just, I really am so glad to be here. And I love what you've done with the skills and all the empowered wife things and books and podcasts. I just, I think it's just great. And I really hope everybody finds, finds you and finds these skills. Thanks. Thank you. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's provoking me this week is from a student who said she read in a book that she could fix her marriage by quote, planning a trip with her husband. It sounds so good, doesn't it? What could possibly go wrong if you plan a romantic getaway for the two of you, leave the kids with grandma and drive off for a couple of days of much needed couple time? Maybe the two of you just need to de-stress and relax together. Everything will be fine by the time you arrive for your long car ride together. Now, those of you who have tried this as a fix for a distant or hostile relationship already know that a road trip or a plane trip or any trip can trip you up even more when you're already in breakdown. I know for my husband and me, when things were really hard and painful and seemed like they were on the verge of self-destructing, we kind of brought that with us wherever we went. It wasn't like the conflict was only happening when we were home. We fought by plane, by boat, by car, and by train. So a change of scenery wasn't particularly helpful. It was also kind of crushing to have the romantic getaway get away from us completely during a blow up in the tense ride home, especially since, quote, plan a trip is pretty common expert advice. And looking back, one problem we had early on was that wherever I went, there I was with no intimacy skills training, thinking I just married the wrong guy and I needed a divorce. You can just imagine the cheerful mood I was creating in that hotel room. Another problem with this platitude about taking a trip solving relationship problems was the idea that we just needed a different environment, a change of scenery instead of, oh, I don't know, possibly some self-reflection and self-development. There was no vacation in the world, relaxing enough to compensate for how critical and controlling I was, which left a frost between us, even on the warmest beaches. Plus. What if you have to drag your guy to this getaway because he doesn't want to go? What fun is that going to be? How is that going to make you feel any less hurt 
and rejected than you did at home when he was just staring at his phone, ignoring you. You can have a great time over a can of soup at home or a miserable time at a five-star restaurant, depending not on where you are, but how you show up. And for that reason, the advice that you should plan a trip is definitely the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about the three ways to fix a broken marriage. And in the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Fun is so important. Today's fun fact is that I got another exciting skin product delivered today, and it's going to erase fine lines, increase collagen, and restore moisture, this time for sure. Mm -hmm.